and I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about something called Cities of Manchester. And at the end, the last um, PowerPoint slide, just a, li a list, I guess, of the sorts of challenges that um, I and my colleagues have faced uh, trying to move this initiative forward. And they're the same kinds of challenges you could think about yourself individually and collectively facing when it comes to working with others in different kinds of ways. And also, I guess, at the end, partly after listening to um, Jerome start off today, some of the skills that I think have been important. Uh, I'm not saying I have them in large doses, but clearly I have exhibited those skills in some ways to get to where we are now. Just so you know, since Manchester was established in September 2010, it's been going just over three years, and it's not a particularly sophisticated idea. Basically, the university took a look across the whole of the university and said there's an awful lot of people working on cities in the social sciences and beyond. And many of them work in groups or centres or institutes, but there's no kind of collective bringing together, no umbrella way of bringing them all together. So, Cities at Manchester was born. Um, and what it's done is tried to create an industry space by people who work on the same cities or different cities with different methodological positions to bring them together academically. So that's one goal. The second is, if you're an outside policymaker or practitioner or stakeholder, you don't really care how the university organises itself internally. Okay? Like any large bureaucracy, it actually doesn't make a lot of sense when you're inside it, never mind outside looking in. <laughs> what someone who wants to know is, who is it that's working on health in the global south? Or working on archives in Bolivia? Okay? They want to know how they can access people. So what Super Manchester has done is to try and create that kind of vehicle, if you like, with some success. We have 180 staff, students who get regular updates from cities at Manchester. There are 85, I mean, that's a bit of a, I mean, we can all claim to have lots of people involved. The more interesting one is 85 staff and students across the university. So though the Faculty of Humanities pays for this, it's a small amount of money every year. It's a university-wide initiative. 85 staff have gone online and entered their keywords, which basically means if you're outside, you can search for who is it that's working on certain issues. And have also worked uh, in terms of the cities. So we can see, we can map where we have uh, expertise on certain cities around the world. A 20 strong advisory board, representation from four, four of the five schools. The only school that's not represented is law. They don't seem to be particularly interested in cities at the moment. We have PGR representation from SOS and from SEED. Uh, and we have a couple of uh, representatives from other faculties. And we have two external reps. So two people from the city region who are interested in cities who can feed back to us, if you like, about the ways in which we're trying to reach out to different audiences. Uh, we have a wide focus, so it's been, it's been deliberately broad. So uh, the School of Arts, Language and Cultures has a number of staff who have signed up to City of Manchester, have been involved in organising events. We have a number of staff from this, from this faculty at school who are on the Strong Advisory Board, who are on the 20 Strong Advisory Board. However, what we're increasingly being put under pressure to do is to try and focus our offer, if you like. And at the moment, we're trying to work around these things. Cities of the environment, cities of society and urban governance. What do we do at Cities of Manchester? Urban forums. We had one last week on uh, fuel poverty. We had 50 odd people in a room in Manchester, off campus with drinks and nibbles afterwards. Not coffee, alcohol, it's after seven o'clock at night. Uh, and nice little bits of food. And we have people talking about the challenges that people are facing around fuel poverty. So these are urban forums. So we organise three or four of these a year. Um, so if any of you have got any ideas about things that you think would be interesting to organise, okay, where you can put together a panel where there's one academic, but it's mostly non academics, come together to talk about issues. Lunchtime policy seminars. So again, the other thing to do is to try and think about in your own field whether there are policy makers and practitioners who you know who would be great to get on campus talking about their work, talking about what they expect from academia. The other thing we did as well in terms of kind of outreachy type stuff, we had a photograph competition. And there was 270 entries, 76 cities in 38 different countries. And later on this year, we're going to have an exhibition where we basically launched at a party the 10 week photographs. Academically, what the City of Manchester have been doing, uh, we had a major event a couple of years ago, World of Cities, where we had 100 of people turn up, mostly academics, people from around the world, talking about the challenges. So in most of the social sciences and the arts, one of the challenges is notions of comparison. How do you compare books, archives, or cities? And the long traditions of comparison in a number of the social sciences and arts disciplines. So we brought two people to different disciplines to talk about notions of comparison. 
Manchester, again, in most of the schools within the Faculty of Humanities, but also beyond, there are individuals, PhD students, academic staff, who are working on Manchester, Manchester and the city region. So trying to bring people together and get them talking about one another, talking to one another about the kind of issues. And then urban pathways. So one of the things cities of Manchester has tried not to do is to try and avoid um, try to avoid um, establishing more and more seminars. There are already, as you know, as you look across the board, lots and lots of departmental institute, centre, group seminars. What we try and do is emphasise the urbanness or the cityness in existing seminar series. So we've co-hosted uh, this year uh, Monty Sociology, uh, Centre for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, Geography, American Studies. There's a great seminar about to take place tomorrow in American Studies on Harlem. Again, we've co-sponsored that. So what we're trying to do is try and basically emphasise the cityness in the different disciplines across the faculty. So, and we give them a bit of money and they use their own bit of money. And it's a good way of embedding, if you like, the model. And finally, in terms of activities, this summer, Summer Institute in Urban Studies, the inaugural one, 25 doctoral students, actually it's not doctoral students, early career research is good. So basically anyone who is in, within three years of completing their PhD, we've got about 70 or 80 applications so far, um, and it's basically bringing together people to talk about planning on uh, undergraduate career, uh, curriculum, about making bids for grants, some of the sort of issues you're talking about here, uh, how to write an academic paper, how to edit a book or a special journal, how to deal with referees' reports, how to do reports when you get uh, get turned down for funding applications. In addition to which, we've got five or six people coming in from different disciplines, working with urban studies to talk about their own work, alongside 20 or 30, including people from this School of Arts and Cultures, coming to talk about their, their work. So there's an element of career development, a bit like these sort of seminar series, but also some substantive, substantive debates around the future of urban studies. And the hope is that we organise it this year. People come in, they get a great week, it'll be very intense, if any of you have been on these kind of things. Very intense, both for the members who are the delegates, but also the staff participating. They'll go back off and talk about Manchester, what a great place it is, we'll generate more PhDs, but then we'll try and run this model forward over the next couple of years. So that's what we've been doing. Uh, finally, obviously, website, uh, lots of visits, etc. Et we've got a blog. I posted six more yesterday, uh, almost 60,000 views. So using social media, we're trying to up, up our game on social media uh, as a way of reaching out and constructing audiences. Someone who has left, unfortunately, I'll come on to this point in a minute, talked about leaders needing followers. And I guess the argument I would make is leaders are constructed and so are followers. If you want people to follow you, okay, they're not born to follow you, you have to play a role. You have to do certain things to get them to think you're worth working with, whether it be writing an article or applying for grants. So a whole series of stuff around videos as well. So the challenges, if you like. So these three years just reflecting about what the challenges are of organising and leading on this sort of initiative. First is, how do you encourage incentivised involvement across the faculty and university? How do you encourage people like you, who have got lots of demands in your time, to do stuff maybe differently, to think about writing or putting in a joint bid? Okay. Why are you all here? Why are you putting in bids and grant application? Why are you thinking, thinking about fellowships? What's the incentive structure? And I have very few strings to pull on that score, I have to say. So it's largely soft skills. I'll come on to in a bit about nudging people, encouraging them, cajoling them. Again, thinking about how you involve different academics, early career researchers, and graduate students. You know, how, how have I been able, thinking about how I've been trying to, and try to involve people across the career spectrum at different points of the life cycle? Actually, graduate students are actually quite easy to mobilise. They can see there's a lot to be gained by going to seminars where there are people thinking about cities maybe differently from their own. Or, for example, and a good, actually a good example would be School of Arts, Language and Cultures, where in some bits of this school, which is a massive school with lots of diversity inside it, there are small pockets of people working on cities, and maybe one or two people, okay? The school I'm in, there's loads of people working on cities. So I take for granted the fact there's always someone to talk to. In these pockets, though, they don't. They may be speaking to someone about Portuguese literature, but every day they don't get to speak to someone about the fact that actually it's urban literature. So they actually like the fact they can bring people together. Reading groups, for example. Capacity building across disciplines and subjects. Again, thinking about how you get people to do things differently. That seems to me, in some ways, one of the basic things about leadership. 
how can you encourage, support, cajole? What else? Uh, I guess these are the sorts of skills when uh, Jerome was um, talking through those kind of definitions. I think one of the things when you're thinking about leadership is these are personal skills. So I think there's a difference that came through in Jerome's talk at the beginning. I was saying to, so there are, there are types of leadership which is largely about reputational capital. Okay, that means you have written a great book, you are cited a lot, you get lots of invitation, and people will kind of migrate towards you anyway. We've all been there at conferences. Then when you get to meet the person, they're a big letdown. Okay, they're uninteresting, uninspiring. There's not much beyond the words, and that will only, so the words will only carry you so far. So in a sense, this is where you get into all this charisma, communication, creative. We talked about innovation or entrepreneurialism at the back. Empathy, to listen, to listen, stimulate. You know, think about you two. Why was it? Who were the people you chose your mentors? You know, why did you choose someone to mentor you? What do you want out of that relationship? Stimulating, thoughtful, understanding. And this is a real challenge for some academics, frankly, because the university is an institution. Some people are institutionalized. It means that they may not have the same sets of skills that are required to be leaders in this kind of way. That doesn't mean to say they're not really bright and they don't go away and do their projects on their own <laughs> and write great books, but do you have all those other things that, for example, the SRC Future Leaders Scheme emphasises these sorts of stuff as well as the intellectual leadership. And then this final point, I guess, which is that I was just thinking about rep reputational capital is necessary but not sufficient, I think. For to be an academic leader, so as I say, you know, in my own discipline, I know people who who are leaving, if you like, because they are the people that are the people to go to because they've written the great books, they get well cited, they get invited. But in a sense, that's not necessarily enough for the kind of academic leadership that clearly the ESRC and the AHRC are acquiring of people who get the kind of awards that you've got or that Johnny Darling in geography got. Uh, well, they actually want for there to be more of this. And certainly, in my own experience of cities of Manchester, working across the whole of the university, is that the reputational capital, the fact that some people have cited my work or bestowed on me a certain reputation, which then goes, gets me some kudos in the university, only goes so far. Uh, to get people to do things differently, which is basically what I've had to do at cities of Manchester, not just me, my colleagues as well, to nudge them, encourage them, incentivize them to do work, to go to meetings, to put in bids, that requires some of this. And so for me, the thing is, when you when I think back up, when I was at your stage of my career, which wasn't that long ago, 15 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, is about how, I come back to the point, about how you tell a story about your CV and how you get a chance to hone and focus and improve these sorts of skills, whether it be organising conference sessions, okay, organising events at your own university, starting with postgraduates, then early career researchers. Okay. So just thinking about how you develop those skills as well as the academic one, as if your life was not busy enough. Okay, thank you. Right. A few more questions? questions for Cynthia, for Kevin? I'll just ask a very broad question. Why cities? Why cities? For me, or why cities big? I guess let's start from you, but yeah. <laughs> Um, well, why? I mean, so City Dimensions have started, uh, so I got involved in 2010 uh, because the heads of uh, then the School of Social Sciences and the head of the School of Environment were not happy with the way it had developed over the first year. Um, so there was already an interest? There was an interest. Well, there was an interest in the sense the university looked at, someone in the university, I can't remember who it was, looked across the board and said, you know what, we've got a lot of people doing work in cities, but actually we're not bringing many grant in, much grant income in. And people keep coming to us and say, how can I find out where all the people who work on cities are? And you point to like eight different websites, different web pages. So there's a sense that we were missing a trick by not bringing them together. Um, and so there's a bit of kind of number counting. You know, you do an audit, the first thing you do, who's doing what? They generate a list of about 300 people, for what it's worth. And we, then the university was convinced there were 300 people who if we could find a way of getting them to do things differently and get to sign up to something, you know, and also it doesn't challenge too much what they were doing, then we'd have something to run with. And then that's when I got involved, so in September 2010. Again, for whatever reason, the two people thought I would be good at doing the job. So, uh, and why city? I think, well, because I think, I guess, intellectually, I'd argue 
um, you know, if you're thinking about big changes in the 21st century, cities are one of the big challenges. If you think about climate change, adaptation, resilience, migration, social cohesion, cities are not just the kind of arena against it all takes place, but they're constitutive. They make a big difference. So, uh, so look at the, the big humanitarian challenges. Some of that, I was having a chat this after our meeting last week, but you know, that's about cities. Okay. So that's why intellectually I would say cities are worth focusing on, but also the pragmatic stuff from the university perspective. It's genius. Unfortunately, of course, like most genius ideas, someone else has them at the same time as you. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't be surprised to know if you look across all the big, interesting universities around the world, they've all got something that's called some version of cities. That doesn't mean to diminish what we do, it just means like everything, it's a very crowded platform. And we just speak to you about what it is we can do well. So, but again, you know, it's cities, we're going to hear about others, examples, but you know, <laughs> think about your own trajectory, about the kind of work that I have to do, that you would have to do. Put together a seminar series, you know, put together a postgraduate workshop, put together any type of work you want to do that involves dealing with real people and those sorts of the skills you're going to need at some stage. In fact, some of you probably have already used these skills uh, to get to where you are now. Thank you.